Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this workshop today. My name is Peyton Steiner, and I'm a product solutions engineer here at Rockset. And today I'm going to be talking to you about optimizing price performance in Rockset. So the agenda for today is first, we're going to go into the Rockset cost breakdown to see how cost is actually determined in Rockset. And spoiler alert, this consists of compute and storage. Um, which we'll be going into next. So first we're going to go into optimizing compute cost and some features we have in order to do this. Then we'll be discussing how to optimize storage costs. And lastly, we're going to finish off with a quick demo showing you how you can estimate your cost using our new pricing calculator on our website and also how you can enable features that we talk about today in the Rockset console. I'd also like to note that um, we've shared the link to the slides in the chat here. So if you'd like to follow along, please feel free to do so. All right, so first going into the Rockset cost breakdown. So Rockset cost is broken down into compute and storage. Compute is consists of price per hour that your virtual instance is running. So for those who don't know, a virtual instance is a set of compute resources that's used to process streaming ingest and your queries. Um, and so for compute cost, you're charged for every hour that the virtual instance is running based on your virtual instance size. The second component to cost is storage, and this is based on a tiered pricing model for how much data you have stored in Rockset. So the purpose of this workshop today is to help you get some more information on features and concepts we have that are intended to help optimize your price performance on both compute and storage. Um, I'd also like to quickly note that you'll see at the top of these slides, I uh, have links to our documentation. So if you want more information on anything that we discussed today, please feel free to check out the links that are at the top of each slide. So first we're gonna dive into optimizing compute costs. So the first thing we're gonna talk about with this are virtual instance types, sizes, and classes. So the different VI types that we have are dedicated and shared, and these each have their own subset of sizes. We'll then talk about the different classes we have. So this is a new feature we've introduced with our virtual instances. And with this, we have general purpose and memory optimized classes. We're then gonna go over a multi-virtual instance architecture. And here we're gonna highlight both ingest and default query VIs. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some virtual instance configuration options we have, including auto-scaling, auto-suspending, micro-batching, and dedicated streaming ingest. First, going into our VI types and sizes, the first VI type we have are shared VIs. These share a global resource pool with other accounts. So the benefit of using shared VIs is that this is a cost-effective way to develop and prototype. It's a cheaper alternative to our other VI type, which we'll go into next. A limit of utilizing shared VIs is that since this is a shared global resource pool, your workload can be affected by others. But again, this is a trade-off in order to get um, a reduced cost for your virtual instance. The sizes that are available for shared VIs are free, nano, micro, and milli, starting with the free, and then price goes up as you increase in size. The next virtual instance type we have are dedicated VIs. These are isolated and meant for production use cases. So the benefits of using dedicated VIs are that your workload is not affected by others since this is your own isolated resource. You also get more compute and memory, when using a dedicated VI. The trade-off here is obviously that the cost will increase, but again, this gives you more compute and memory for your production use cases. The sizes that come with dedicated virtual instance type range from extra small to 16 XL. And as you go up in size here, you'll double the compute and memory available. Next, I wanna talk about VI classes. So this is a new concept that we've introduced. The first class I'd like to talk about is memory optimized. So this is what our virtual instances have always been prior to this new concept of classes. 
Memory optimized classes are ideal for queries processing large data sets or that have a large working set size due to a mix of queries running on the virtual instance. The benefit of using a memory optimized BI class is that you get double the amount of memory than the general purpose class when using the same VI size. So for instance, if you're running on a small VI, you'll get the same amount of compute, whether you're using memory optimized or general purpose, but memory optimized will give you more memory. So the general purpose VI class, this is our new class. And I'd also like to note that this is a beta feature. So it is subject to some change. The general purpose VI class is suitable for many workloads, and it's especially ideal if your ingest and query workloads work with search characteristics, a moderate working set size, queries that don't require much memory to process. The benefit of using general purpose is that it balances compute and memory resources at a reduced cost. So as I mentioned, you'll get the same amount of resources compute resources as the memory optimized VI class, but reduced memory saving cost on memory that you don't need. The limit of using general purpose VI classes is that it's currently only available for dedicated VIs ranging from size small to 16 XL. We do have general purpose extra small VI coming soon. So stay tuned for that if you're interested. Now that we've talked about both of these classes, I want to briefly go over when you might want to consider switching from one to the other. So for instance, you might want to switch to a memory optimized VI if you're running on a general purpose and observing frequent resource exhausted errors due to memory. Again, this is because with memory optimized, you'll get the same amount of compute resources, but you'll also have more memory available. You might want to consider switching to general purpose if, for instance, you're running on a memory optimized and have low memory utilization around less than 60% and moderate CPU utilization. However, going to a smaller VI would potentially hurt your query performance. Again, this is because the general, pur general purpose VI will give you the same amount of compute resources, but you have less memory, so you're not paying for memory that you don't need. It's highly recommended that you don't switch from memory optimized to general purpose until your memory utilization is consistently around this less than 60% range, just to be sure that you don't run into any issues with memory. Now I want to briefly touch on just some virtual instance pricing examples so you can kind of see um, the differences between all the options that we've talked about. So first here you can see a snapshot of the different dedicated virtual instance prices for the US to West region. Prices will vary based on the region that you have. And we have a few different region options. So I highly recommend if you're ever searching for a source of truth for pricing, you can either find that on our pricing calculator, which I'll be demoing later, or by navigating to the billing tab of the Rockset console, which will have a price breakdown specific to your organization configurations. Um, but I've included this snapshot here just so you can briefly see the difference between the various size options as well as general purpose versus memory optimized. And again, compute is charged per hour that your virtual instance is running. This is another just brief snapshot to show you the differences between the shared virtual instance types. Again, this is specific to the US West region. Now that we've gone over our types, sizes, and classes, I want to just briefly touch on deciding which VI size and class might be right for you. I'm not going to go too in-depth to this, but um, I've linked some great resources at the top of this slide where we have more specific use case examples that will guide you on selecting the right size and class for your use case. A couple good general rules of thumb are if your resource utilization is high or low, you might want to consider switching your VI size. And if your memory or CPU utilization are high or low, you might want to consider switching VI class. Again, this is so that you're only paying for what you need. Some other factors to consider are data size, query complexity, query selectivity, working set size, query load, query latency, and streaming ingest load. These are all factors that might play into which size and class are the right fit for you. So please consider these as well as you're choosing the right size and class. 
Next, we're going to go into multi-virtual instance architecture. So multi-virtual instance architecture allows you to isolate and independently scale compute for streaming ingest, low latency queries, and multiple applications, otherwise known as compute compute separation. We highly recommend using a multi-VI architecture because the benefits of this are that you separate your ingest VI from query VIs, so you're isolating these two workloads. It also allows you to tune your VIs separately to handle their specific wor workloads at a reduced cost so that each VI is only configured for what you need for that workload. And lastly, Workloads served by one VI don't affect workloads on any other VI because virtual instances are their own isolated resources. A limit of multi-VI architecture is that it is only available for dedicated VIs. So again, that extra small to 16 XL size. With multi-VI architecture, I wanna talk about one of our new features, default query VI. And I'd also like to note that this is a beta feature, so it is subject to some documentation changes. So every organization starts off with a main virtual instance that is configured to be both the ingest VI and the default query VI. However, we highly recommend, recommend that you update one query VI to be the default query VI instead of this main one. This is because there are a few benefits with this. So again, this allows you to isolate your ingest and query workloads, tuning each of these separately in order to keep costs reduced. Also, by having your main VI be the ingest VI and using a second secondary VI as the default query VI, you can couple micro-batching with this, which allows you to auto-suspend and resume your ingest VI to save on compute costs. Microbatching is another one of our new features that I'm going to get into in just a little bit to give you some more information on how to utilize that. A couple notes on default query BI are that this affects API requests that exe execute queries on the default query BI. And this is because pretty straightforward that whatever you set to be the default query BI will be used to run queries on for these API requests. You also must have the necessary permissions in order to manage this configuration. So in this case, you need to have the update deployment default query VI permission. This is included for admin roles, but not other roles. So please make sure that if you're trying to configure this, that you have this necessary permission for your role. You also cannot delete the default query VI. So if you would like to delete it, you'll have to set up a different VI to be the new default query VI in order to do that. Lastly, default query VIs are only available for virtual instances with live mounts. We're not going to get too much into mounts in this workshop. However, this is something to do with mounting collections to your virtual instance. Um, and it's just an important limitation to know when using default query VIs. If you'd like to learn more about this and other limitations, please reference the default query VI documentation. Now I'd like to talk about some virtual instance configuration options that we have. The first one being auto scaling. I'd like to note that this is also a beta feature and it also is currently only available with the premium edition of Rockset. So auto scaling automatically adjusts your virtual instance size according to your current workload demands. The benefits of using auto scaling are that it allows you to auto scale up your virtual instance during heavier workloads, giving you better performance and allows you to auto scale down your virtual instance when it is idle, saving you resources and cost. So how exactly does auto scaling work? It works by analyzing the VI CPU utilization, and this is observed using an iterative decay approach. So you, your VI will auto scale up when the CPU utilization decay value is greater than 75% and it'll auto scale down when CPU utilization decay value is less than 25%. After your VI switch is completed, there's distinct cooldown periods of three minutes and one hour observed for subsequent auto scale up and down actions respectively. A limit for auto scaling is that it's currently only available for the main virtual instance. It can be enabled for secondary virtual instances if that's something you're interested in please contact Rockset support if that is something you would like to consider so that we can determine if we can go ahead and enable that for your secondary virtual instances. 
The next configuration I want to talk about is auto suspending. So with auto suspending, your VI will suspend after a specified amount of time of the virtual instance not being queried. By default, all virtual instances will suspend after one hour. However, you can configure this to be a different amount of time or you can disable this. However, we highly recommend utilizing auto suspending as the benefit here is that you're saving on compute costs when your virtual instance is idle. Some limits with auto suspending are that it's only available for non-ingest VIs, so all of your secondary VIs, but not that main one that is configured to be the ingest VI. However, we do have this feature called micro-batching that does do some auto suspending on your ingest VI. So this is another new beta feature that we have. So when micro-batching is enabled, your ingest VI will automatically suspend once ingest has caught up and it will resume on a specified time interval. The benefit of using micro-batching is that it trades off costs with ingest latency. So your ingest VI will be suspended, saving you, comp saving you compute costs, but um, there will be a little bit of ingest latency with that. How this works is that your VI will su cyclically suspend when average document detection latency across your virtual instance over the last five minutes is less than 60 seconds. And this is what we're referring to as your ingest being caught up. And then your VI will resume on an interval specified by you. You can also resume the VI manually at any time if you don't want to wait for this time interval to pass. I'd also like to quickly note that document detection latency is different than ingest latency. So document detection latency is the time it takes for a document inserted or updated in the source to be detected by Rockset. However, ingest latency is the time it takes for a document inserted or updated in the source to be queryable. So ingest latency includes both document detection latency plus processing latency. Some limits of micro-batching are that you must configure a separate default query VI in order to utilize this. So as I mentioned, everybody starts with a main virtual instance that is configured to be both the ingest VI and the default query VI. However, you will need to configure a secondary VI that is the new default query VI in order to use micro-batching. You also cannot set the main virtual instance to be the default query VI if micro-batching is enabled. Um, so a note on this is that we actually recommend not suspending your default query VI because by default, if all queries are, are routed to that virtual instance and that virtual instance gets suspended, then any queries that are running will error and not complete. So if micro-batching is enabled and your virtual instance is suspended, then you might run into some issues with your queries. So for that reason, you cannot set the main VI to be the default query VI when micro-batching is enabled. It's recommended to use micro-batching if you don't mind having higher ingest latency for a lower cost, and if your ingest is periodic or sporadic, so you don't necessarily need your ingest VI to immediately pick up on your ingest workload. The next thing I want to talk about is dedicated streaming ingest. Again, this is another new beta feature, and it is also only available for the premium edition of Rockset. So this is a little bit more on the performance side, but I just want to highlight it as it is one of our new features that is an option for you. So with dedicated streaming ingest, this provisions dedicated tailor infrastructure and applies configurations to deliver best performance for latency sensitive ingest operations. The benefit here is that you'll be provided with lower and more stable ingest latency. So how exactly does this work? With dedicated streaming ingest, there's a dedicated isolated set of compute resources for tailor operations directed onto the default VI that are not subject to auto scaling activities. So non-dedicated streaming ingest is designed to provide the lowest average latencies at an optimal price point. However, this is subject to tailor auto scaling activities, which can result in observable increases in latencies. However, with dedicated ingest streaming enabled, there's a fixed number of resources provisioned proportional to your VI size that are not subject to these auto scaling activities, providing you with more stable ingest latency. This also has batch sizes and buffer flush times configured for low latency. This is recommended if your use case requires consistently lower ingest latencies. 
Again, not going to go super further into detail on this, but please refer to our documentation if you're interested in learning more about this feature. That concludes all of our compute cost features. So now we're going to dive into optimizing storage costs in Rockset. So with storage costs, we're going to talk about ingest transformations, rollups, collection retention policies, and storage compression. Starting off with ingest transformations, ingest transformations enable you to run SQL queries over data from sources and only persists the output of those queries to your collection. So the benefit here is that you can reduce storage size and cost since you're only persisting the data that you really care about having in your Rockset collection. How this works is that the ingestion platform will apply the transformation during initial load and on an ongoing basis. So all new documents that come into the collection will also have this ingest transformation applied to them. You also can apply ingest transformations at either the collection or source level or both source level ingest transformations will first be applied and then collection level transformations. Some limits of ingest transformations are that Editing your ingest transformation, which can be done via the Rockset API, will only be applied to new documents. So if you would like to edit your ingest transformation, we recommend that you recreate the collection typically with this new ingest transformation. Also, you cannot use joins currently in ingest transformations. There are some other limits as well with this. Uh, if you're interested in reading more on that, I recommend viewing our documentation for that full list of limits and more in information on ingest transformations. Next, we're going to talk about rollups. So real-time aggregations or rollups are a class of ingest transformations that enable you to aggregate data as it is ingested, combining multiple documents into one. So the benefits here are that, again, this gives you reduced storage size and cost since you're only persisting data that you care about having in your collection. This also helps improve query performance since you're pre-aggregating your data so you don't need to include these aggregations in your queries. How rollups work are simply by adding a group by clause in your ingest transformation to perform these aggregations. A limit with rollups is that it's only available for some popular data sources. So if you would like to learn more about rollups or considering using it, please make sure to reference your specific source documentation to see if rollups are available. Next, I want to talk about collection retention. So for each collection, you can set a custom retention duration. The benefit of this is that it'll limit your storage costs while ensuring you're querying the latest data that you actually care about. How this works is that data gets partitioned internally on time ranges. And once the event time field for all documents within that partition fall out of the specified retention window, the whole partition is dropped, deleting all expired documents. The limit here to note is that the minimum allowable retention is currently one hour. However, there's granularity by hour, day, month, year. The last concept I want to talk about is storage compression. So we have two options for data compression, LZ4 and Z standard. So the benefit of using LZ4 is that this is optimized for compression and decompression speeds, giving you lower latency queries. Z standard, the benefit is that there is stronger data compression ratio, giving you smaller storage sizes. I'd also like to note that in most cases, storage compression does not negatively impact query performance, as most working data sets fit in the VI catch, which is inherently uncompressed. If you want to learn more about these storage compression options, again, I recommend that you check out our documentation. Now we're going to dive into our quick demo. So first, I'm going to show you how you can estimate your cost using our new pricing calculator on our website. And then we're going to hop over to the Rockset console, where I'm going to show you how you can enable some of the features that we talked about today. So I'm going to go ahead and first click on this link to our pricing calculator. You can see here it's taking you to a page on our website. If you scroll to the top, you can see first it talks about that cost breakdown that we discussed at the beginning of the workshop today, if you want some more information on that. And then we have the pricing calculator. So here you can select all information that applies to your organization, including your region, the addition you plan to have, instance class, 
virtual instance size and your planned amount of storage in order to estimate your price per month and also your price per hour. So you can see here that with the current configurations, this is our price per month. However, if you wanna change any of these options, let's say that you plan on utilizing memory optimized class instead of general purpose. If you click that, you can see this immediately updates with your new estimated price. You can also see in this step two for compute, there's an option to set both your maximum and minimum VI size. So again, reminder here that you, if you're planning on using auto scaling, you could set what you plan to have be your minimum and maximum virtual instance sizes here. And then you can select the amount of time you expect to be at the minimum VI size. You can also adjust this to see how the price changes there. So this is a great way to just get a rough estimate of what your price might be if you know all of these configurations for your organization. I also recommend reaching out to us if you further want to discuss your price breakdown or any discounts or cost optimizations with our team. There's a contact us button here that will allow you to do that. So now that we've gone over that, I'm going to hop over to the Rockset console. So here on our virtual instances page, you can see that I currently have a main virtual instance, and this is configured as both my ingest and default query VI. However, as we talked about, we highly recommend using a multi-VI architecture. So the first thing I want to do is create a new virtual instance that I'm going to be using for querying. So I'm going to go ahead and name this my analytics virtual instance. And I don't plan to have a need for high memory, so I'm actually going to select general purpose as my instance class. And then I'm going to go ahead and select medium as my virtual instance size. You can see also there's an option here for additional configuration. Here we see the auto suspend policy, which defaults to one hour. But if you click this drop down, you can go ahead and set it to any range that you would like. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at one hour for now. There's also some information here about mount type and remounting on resume. We didn't really go over mounting today, but if you're interested in learning more about these, again, please check out our documentation and see how you maybe would configure these differently for your use case. So now I'm gonna go ahead and click create virtual instance. This might take a few minutes to go ahead and initialize, but while that's happening, we're gonna go back to our main virtual instance and set up some other configurations here. So there's a couple different ways that you can change the configuration on your virtual instance. The first is you can see that there's three dots right here that you can go ahead and click. You'll see we have a few options here. We have configure microbatching, change default query VI, and edit. So I'm going to go ahead and click edit. You'll see now we have a similar pop-up to what we just had when we were creating our new virtual instance. So if I go ahead and click initial configuration here, you'll see there's some different options here since this is our ingest virtual instance. And as I discussed, the ingest virtual instance has some different capabilities than your other secondary VIs. So we can see there's the option for microbatching here. However, I'm not currently able to do that because my main VI right now is also my default query VI. And as I mentioned, this is a limitation you cannot enable microbatching when your main VI is also the default query VI. So we'll go ahead and wait to enable that once we change our default query VI. I am going to enable auto scaling here though, which you can do by easily just clicking this button. You can also here specify the minimum size and the maximum size that you want to be able to scale to. So let's say that I actually just want to go from small to medium, or if I want to go from small to large, you can easily just specify that right there. Then I'm going to go ahead and click Confirm. And now I'm going to show you how else you can change the configuration settings for your virtual instance. So if you click on the virtual instance itself, you'll see that there are some toggles here that allow you to also easily change any configurations. So here, if I want to enable dedicated streaming ingest for my main VI, I can simply just click this little pop-up giving you some information on doing this before you proceed. I'm gonna go ahead and click yes, and we'll see that now that's enabling. Also, if I decide that I wanna turn off auto scaling, you can easily just click this button right here and see 
how quickly that was done. But I actually do want to keep auto scaling on because again, we highly recommend this to help you save on your compute costs. Oh, so ran into a little bit of an error there because since this is enabling, it's not letting me adjust that configuration, but that'll just take a few more moments. I'm gonna go ahead and hard refresh here to see if our analytics VI is ready. So we can see here, this is still initializing. Sometimes it just takes a few minutes. This is totally normal. So just have to wait. Um, but while we're waiting, if anybody has any questions or anything, please feel free to share in the chat. No questions, cool. Must be doing a great job explaining everything. Go ahead and give this another hard refresh. Still just taking a few more moments. All right, we can see now that our analytics virtual instance is active. Again, you can click on the virtual instance to get all the details here. So now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and change our default query VI. So you can do that by, again, either clicking those three buttons there and clicking change default query VI. We also have this little light bulb here that if you click on that, there's also a workflow here for changing your default query VI. Either way it works takes you to the same place. So I'm gonna go ahead and follow the steps here. So the first thing it asks, asks for is your target virtual instance that you want to make the new default query VI. So if I click the drop down here, you'll see that I have the analytics VI just created as an option. You can also create a new VI in this workflow, but I'm just gonna select the analytics one that we created there. And you'll see now here, we have a pop-up that lets you know we recommend disabling auto suspend since all queries will be sent to the default query VI and they these queries will subsequently fail if the VI is suspended. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and disable auto suspending for this virtual instance. Then I'm gonna go ahead and click next. This is regarding mounting collections, which again, we didn't go too much into, but it is recommended that you mount all collections for your default query VI, since collections must be mounted to a virtual instance in order to be able to query them. So if you're doing this, just make sure that you select all collections that you plan on querying, then go ahead and click next. This might take a few seconds, minutes, depending on how many collections you have. And then we can see the last step here is just to confirm your new default options. So the current default query VI was our main, and now we're switching this over to our analytics VI. So I'm gonna go ahead and click confirm. And you can see here that now our analytics VI has this tag that it is our default query VI. So now that we've switched our main VI to just be ingest, we can go ahead and configure micro batching. Again, this is super simple to do. You just click the three dots here, click configure micro batching, and then you'll get this pop-up here that allows you to specify your resume interval Again, this interval that you specify is the time that it'll take for your VI to resume after it has suspended from being caught up on ingest. It defaults to every 15 minutes, but you can change the selection if you would like. I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it at 15 and then click confirm. And it's just that simple. And if you wanna change any configurations at any time, you can, again, just use those three dots, edit there. You can also select the virtual instance itself and choose any of the toggles. You can also very easily change your size and class at any time by clicking the little arrows here. So you'll see our size currently is medium. If we click this drop down and I want to change it to a different size, I can go ahead and select large here. It'll confirm 
it's giving me a warning here since I'm currently on a trial and a large virtual instance is more cost. So just wants to let me know to be careful with this as I only have a certain amount of trial credits, but I'm gonna go ahead and click proceed. And then you can see the status says switching to large. You can also see that there's the drop down for your class. So our main BI is currently on memory optimized. However, if I want to switch to general purpose, I can easily just select that here. So yeah, that's how quick and easy it is to change any of these configurations within the Rockset console. You can also change any of these via the Rockset API. Just navigate to the virtual instances tab in our API reference to find most of these API references. Next, we're going to talk about some of the storage features that we discuss. So I'm going to navigate to the collections tab of our Rockset console, and I'm going to go ahead and click create collection. You can see here you can select any data source that you want to use. However, we're just going to use a public data set. So these are already loaded into Rockset. I'm going to select the movies data set, film releases, which just has data on a ton of movies. Then you go ahead and click start. You'll see here that there's a preview of what the data looks like from the source. If I go ahead and click next, you'll see this takes us to a page on transforming our data. So using an ingest transformation is as easy as just specifying a query right here. And then you can see the immediate transformed data preview right below. If you want to reference what this looks like compared to the source data, you can toggle between the two to see the difference. So here you can see we're only selecting the fields that we actually care about. So we're reducing our storage, our storage cost by not including fields that aren't necessary for our use case. And if you want to use rollups, again, this is also where you would do that in this query editor. So I'm going to go ahead and click Next. Now this will take us to the final step where you'll specify the workspace, collection name. We're just going to call this Film Releases. And you can see down here we have an option to set our retention policy. So the default is to keep all documents. However, if you do want to set a retention policy, you simply just click this button here, and then you can specify how many days months, weeks, hours you want for your granularity, and then you can change the number here to whatever you desire. And lastly, you'll see there's an option for data compression. So currently, this is set to Z standard. However, if you want to change to LZ4, you simply just click the drop down and select that. I'm going to go ahead and just create this with Z standard. You'll see also your ingest transformation is here for review just to ensure that everything is as you expect, and then you can just easily hit create to create your collection with these configurations. So that's all for being able to use these features in the Rockset console, but again, you can also do all of these via the Rockset API. So that concludes our presentation for today. I hope that this workshop gave you some more insight on various features that we have targeted towards making sure that you're optimizing price performance in Rockset by only paying for what you need. Please, again, reach out to any of our team if you have any further questions and use the slides that we had here today to find links to more documentation on all of these concepts. Thank you all.